interesting and inter interactive hour for us. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you. And got a little presentation for everyone here. Great. Uh, yeah, I wanted to share a little bit about me. Kirsty, thanks so much for having me and for, for the introduction. And, and um, I'll just go through this briefly because Kirsty kind of um, you know, told you a little bit about me. But you know, I spent my early career uh, working in New York City government um, in a you know, large public uh, service uh, you know, government agencies. Um, I studied leadership management, conflict resolution at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. I founded and led a charter school in the South Bronx uh, in New York City. Uh, and I am currently an executive coach working with tech startups, small businesses, and leaders at large organizations. I'm also a psychotherapist with training in psychoanalysis, trauma, and energy psychology. Studied Buddhism and meditation in Vietnam. I uh, was there for about two years um, and, and um, got to do some deep study with uh, uh, some of the um, monks there and got to study at Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a, kind of one of the people who brought mindfulness to the West. Um, got to study at the monastery where, where he, he trained as a young monk. Um, and last but not least, I have three kids and live in Oakland, California. So that's a little, a little bit about me. So I'll tell you a little bit about my new book, The Peak Performance Formula, and tell you a little bit about what's in it and sort of just give you a kind of broad overview. And then I want to get into a little bit of the content. So really what the book is, what I intended it to be, was a leadership guide to being your best. And, you know, one of the, one of the ways I, just, I define peak performance is not being the best, but being your best really you know, focused on self-improvement, focused on being better than you were yesterday, developing your own skills um, and your own sense of fulfillment, not necessarily competing with others to be you know, sort of the, the best, which is great. You know, if, 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 if any of us have the opportunity to be the best at something, awesome, amazing. Um, but what I'm more focused on is, is really being your best, living up to your, uh, your potential. And the, the sort of way that I go about um, unpacking that is first with an understanding of something that I call the performance paradox. And this is basically how we work against our own success and fulfillment. In, in many ways, you know, we are designed to survive. That is sort of the, the um, you know, th th that is our, uh, you know, top goal as organisms is to survive. Um, and that can come into conflict with achieving more transcendent goals, feeling feelings of fulfillment um, and accomplishment. And so I really unpack this paradox, this notion that while many of us um, have things we want to achieve, have, have goals that we want to attain, um, we are often um, our own worst enemies in achieving those goals. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on in our subconscious minds. There's stuff going on in our self-conscious minds, which is around, you know, kind of what other people think of us, our fear, fear of other people's opinions, fear of failure, um, our negativity bias, uh, that neuroscientists have coined the term negativity bias, ways in which um, we can um, really amplify threat um, and be overly concerned with, the, with negative things that are happening as opposed to all the great things that are happening in our lives. Um, and a number of other, uh, of, other um, of these performance paradoxes. So really unpacking how we get in our own way. And then once we understand that, learning a formula, the peak performance formula for overcoming these obstacles. And, you know, sort of just in a nutshell, the formula is our purpose, our values, and our vision. Being able to have clarity of these three things can take us uh, much of the way to our to achieving our own our own potential of, of of performance, and again, that means success and fulfillment. Um, and so, learning that formula, understanding, deep diving more into purpose, more into values, more into vision, what these things mean, um, where they come from, how to use them in your own in your own life. Um, and then I get into using the tools and tactics that elite performers use when it comes to managing energy. That's sort of our own ability to uh, 
you know, be productive without burning out, you know, sort of in, in athletics, it's like training without overtraining and hurting ourselves or fatiguing ourselves, overly fatiguing ourselves. So how do we manage our energy to, uh, to perform sustainably day in, day out at our highest levels? Training technique, this is, you know, no matter what we are aspiring to do, there is probably some skill involved. And so what is the best way, the smartest way to train that technique and get better in the things that you need to get better in to, uh, you know, attain the goals that you want to attain. So how do we, how do we, how do we really train technique using um, tools and tactics of, of top performers? And then last, but certainly not least, training our minds. Um, and so, so much of, you know, of, of what we do is mental, so much of performance is mental. Um, and so how do we train our minds to, again, counter many of these performance paradoxes, to be able to be focused, to be able to pay attention, to be able to drown out the noise and really focus on what's most important, to stay calm, um, to stay positive. So really, how do we train our minds, again, using the tools and tactics of, of elite performers? Then I zero in on the most common challenges that I that I see. Uh, this much of this is from my own client base as an executive coach, as well as my work as a psychotherapist, as well as you know interviewing tons of high performers and you know sort of reading you know sort of all the literature I, I can get my hands on. And these are the things that seem to come up the most when I'm when I'm working with with leaders: fear of failure, imposter syndrome managing the day-to-day -day stress and anxiety, building one success team and performing in a crisis. So I really zero in on those and kind of give specifics around how do you apply the, 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 this formula to these, um, to, 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 to these specific kind of challenges. Um, and then we focus the formula on where you spend most of your life. That's parenting, leadership, and organizations. And so parenting, you know, there's been a lot in the last bunch of years around um, you see these elite athletes who are now having children and continuing to be elite in, in their sport, um, which is great and fine and good. They used to retire and then have and then have kids. Tennis is, a, is an example. It's a sport that I play and I and I follow closely um, more and more athletes in tennis are having children and continuing to play at high levels. And that's good. But I, I'm talking about something a little bit different. This is how do we actually bring the tools and tactics of high performance to our role as parents? How do we become peak performing parents? How do we have peak performing families um, by applying purpose, values, and vision? And so there's a chapter specifically on peak performance parenting. There's a chapter on leadership. This is, you know, you know we're all leaders. We're all in organizations um, trying to influence those organizations, trying to um, achieve, you know, achieve goals. And so how do we really apply uh, these tools and techniques to our leadership endeavors? And then organizations, how do we ultimately you know, build organizations that are high performing, that are peak performing organizations? So there's a chapter uh, on that. Um, and then the, the book kind of ends with a 30 day peak performance challenge uh, where I walk you through in 30 days how to apply the peak performance formula. Um, and that is really to show you how to apply what's in the book uh, in your life, because I know many of these books have a lot of great ideas and then you put them down and you're like, well, I, I don't really know how to do this. And so I wanted to give you a, a guide that you will you you will pick a challenge, something that you want to make break, breakthrough performance in over 30 days. And it walks you through the steps of how to do that. Um, and hopefully it also not only teaches you how to apply the the um, the what's in the book, but it also helps you build the habits of mind. You know, we do anything for, you know, uh, you, you know, a month and we begin to develop some habits um, there. So that's sort of just a sort of, you know, sort of summary or, or overview of what's it, what's in the book. Um, I want to jump in a little bit, dig in a little bit to these leadership challenges, these challenges that many of us in leadership positions face. And really the, the, the challenges that uh, leaders most commonly face. Um, and, um, you know, there are others, but these are the ones that sort of, again, kind of come up again and again, uh, that I want to just lay out and see, you know, hopefully these, these resonate and feel familiar to you. Um, the first one is, is really understanding yourself as a leader. And again, this goes back to your, your what, what's your purpose? What are your values that guide your leadership? 
choices and decisions? And what's your vision? What's your vision for yourself and your own career? What's your vision for the team you lead or the organization that, that you run? What are your strengths? And maybe more importantly, and maybe a little harder to, to look at, what are your flaws? So strengths, obviously, these are the things that we're really good at that we should be doubling down on. We should really be leading from a place of, of our strengths. But we also need to know our flaws. We need to know the areas where we can really improve and the places where we want to be careful that we don't, if we are in a leadership position, where, that we don't project them into, into our organizations or our teams. And I write a little bit about this notion of projecting our flaws as leaders into organizations. Um, uh, entrepreneur and, and venture capitalist Ben Horowitz talks about, about this projecting your flaws into, into the companies that you that you work in, teams you lead, companies you run. Um, and you know, his example is he would always, he loved to get into deep conversation. And so none of his meetings had agendas and they would all run over time. And he needed to put in place some safeguards, uh, making sure there were agendas, making sure that there, were, there was a timekeeper, people stopping you know, the meeting um, that would help him to manage his flaw of you know, just kind of loving endless debate. How we delegate, give feedback, and make decisions. So obviously, you know, we all know in, in leadership positions, these are key uh, key aspects of leadership. You know, we're not individual contributors anymore. We're not leaders. We're managers. We need to delegate. We need to give feedback to help people improve. Sometimes that's 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 hard feedback to give. Um, and how do we make decisions? And how are we explicit in our decision making process? Do we know how we make decisions, um, or are we just kind of winging it? Uh, and then last but not least here is how do you mobilize and inspire others? Obviously, a core to leading uh, a team or an organization is your ability to mobilize and inspire people. And so how do you do that? What's your, what's your secret sauce of mobilizing and inspiring others and being clear about how to do that and continuing to refine and develop it? Okay. Second major challenge, energy management, which I spoke a little bit about in the previous slide. This is again about productivity, how productive we are, how, how well we use our time. Um, and this is again, going back to sort of an athletic uh, analogy. This is the, this notion of um, how much we train versus how much we recover. Um, and in, you know, in, in athletics, there's, uh, you spend a lot of time training, you spend a little time competing, and you spend a lot of time recovering. And in the world of work, we get we have it backwards. We spend all of our time competing, working. We spend very little time training. That's like professional development stuff or taking a course. And we spend almost no time recovering. Um, and you know, athletes, you know, sort of especially over the last decade, um, have really figured out that it's all in the recovery. Sustainable day in day out high performance is about how well we recover. And so a lot of the book talks about this notion of recovery and how we can recover so that we can, you know, continue to work, uh, you know, at our sort of highest levels day in, day out. So there's this, the, the, this question that always comes up of work-life balance. Is it possible? Is it achievable? Um, is there such thing as work-life balance? Um, and I believe that there is, and there's, and, you know, there's, a, you know, the, I like to think of it as work-life integration um, or harmony. Um, but there are ways in which we can manage our time, manage our energy so that we can have a more fulfilling work life and a more fulfilling personal life. And the, the book gets into some of that. And then burnout, really burnout avoidance. And this is, you know, the ultimate sort of failure of energy management is to, uh, is to, is to be burned out. Um, and, you know, many of us are, are, you know, have been running on fumes over the last, you know, year and a half. Um, and we really need to do some stuff to take care of ourselves to ensure that we are not burned out. And the, the, the practices in the peak performance formula really help you to re-engage with what is most meaningful and exciting to you, as well as some of these, these energy management practices that help make sure you still have gas in the tank. Um, because it's very hard, no matter how much you care about something, when you, know, you are you know, sort of running on empty, it's very hard to you know, continue to, 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 to do that thing and, and, and bring the same levels of passion to it that you would want to. Okay, self-limiting beliefs is, is the, this next challenge that I see leaders most commonly face. And this is, I just saw, read a great quote yesterday 
uh, from Muhammad Ali, where he said, my only fault is that I, I don't realize how great I really am. This is coming from, from Muhammad Ali, you know, probably, you know, best boxer of all time. And I love that it really sums up this notion of self limiting beliefs. These beliefs that we have, many of which are again, subconscious or, or implicit, um, that really constrain us from um, being all that we can be, having all that we can have, enjoying all that we can enjoy. And some of these beliefs, you know, fall into these categories of being a perfectionist, believing everything has to be perfect. Um, and if it's not perfect, then, you know, it's, it's might as well be, you know, thrown in the garbage. You know, the controller, this sort of controlling self limiting belief, I need to be in control of everything. If I'm not in control of everything, you know, it's going to, you know, go to, go to heck in a handbasket. So I really need to, I have to control everything. I can't delegate anything. I can't, you know, let anyone else, you know, you know, do any of it. I got it. I have to be involved in everything. The pleaser, you know, which is that, you know, we've, we've all been there. We want to be liked. We want to be loved. Um, you know, many of us have grown up this way of needing to please others to, uh, in order to feel valuable or lovable. Uh, we have to, we have to, you know, be people pleasers and the costs that come with that. It can be then very hard to make tough decisions and to give hard feedback. Um, and, and the last one, and the one that I, I, I feel like I deal with most, most commonly is imposter syndrome. Um, and this is that feeling, um, despite good evidence otherwise, that we are phonies and that we don't belong. Um, and this can get really can get triggered um, in um, situations where, you know, maybe we don't have the same credentials as others. Maybe we're younger. Uh, maybe we're in a in an out group. Um, we're not in the inner circle. Maybe we're, we're in some kind of competition. We're applying for a fellowship or we're applying for a job and there's chance of rejection. We're pitching something. We're pitching a company. We're trying to get uh, investment dollars for our, for our venture. Um, any, any time when we can get rejected um, and our ideas can really be questioned um, as you know, good ones, um, the imposter can, come, can, can, can creep out. Um, and so we really need to be able to manage um, and shift and transform these self-limiting beliefs. Stress, anxiety, and almost constant feel of failure. So this is another one I see uh, quite, um, you know, quite a lot is especially working with founders, working with those in startups where, you know, they are trying to do something that has never been done before. Uh, they are um, often months, if not weeks, away from running out of money. Um, there are uh, competitors, you know, you know, biting, biting at their heels. Um, and there's this daily stress, anxiety, and fear of failure. And there can often also be this fear of, well, if, if I fail at what I do, then that makes me a failure. And this identification with, uh, with you know, so failing at something, meaning that, that we are failures. And then, and then ultimately it is about how do we design organizations that get the outcomes we want, organizations or teams um, that get to get the outcomes that we're, we, we're looking for. And this is around sourcing, hiring, training, and retaining top talent. And it's also about creating a strong, positive culture with clear policies, norms, rituals, uh, and cues. And to be able to, to, to do this um, in a, you know, in a, in a sort of methodical way um, that really, again, is, des is designed to get the, the types of outcomes that it is we're looking for. So these are the challenges that, that, that you know, leaders that I see most commonly face and that I wrote the book um, really with these challenges in mind to, to really help uh, anyone who is dealing with any of these challenges to have some tools and framework to, to, uh, to, to deal with them, to manage them, to overcome them. So I wanted to share with you the first peak performance pillar. I wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive with you all today um, and share with you this first pillar of peak performance, which is purpose. And purpose goes a long way in dealing with a lot of the challenges that I just shared with you. And I want to I want to sort of show you the power of purpose. You've probably been hearing uh, about a lot about purpose. I know I don't know if it's just me because I follow this stuff, but it seems like purpose is sort of popping up um, everywhere. People are talking about your purpose, find your purpose. 
you know, live a, pur a purposeful life, reconnect with your purpose. Um, and it, it, it really seems like purpose has sort of, you know, the time, the sort of the time has come um, with this concept of purpose. And I've been working with studying, practicing um, ways of really articulating and enacting purpose, um, you know, for many years now. And so I want to sh share with you some of the you know, some of what I found and, and, and what's in the book. So purpose is the first pillar of peak performance. And, and you know, purpose is, is the expression of what's most deeply meaningful to you, who you are at your essence. That's how I, that's how I define purpose. It helps us clarify what really matters and points us to what we should be using our skills and talents for. And it gives us courage to act in conditions of uncertainty and difficulty. So there's this, there's this notion when we're clear on our purpose, it, it helps us be courageous. It helps us say, you know, it's an uncertain time. It's a difficult time. This is a big challenge, but because I'm clear on my purpose, I can, I, I can, I know what I need to do and I have the courage to do it. It functions to both ground us and help us move forward. So it's a grounding when, when we're clear on our purpose, it's grounding. It like, it like strengthens our legs underneath us. It sort of gives us this feeling of like, I, I can sort of handle the situation here, wherever I am, but it also helps move us forward. It also helps to propel us in this way of being a North Star. It sort of gives us, you know, in, in the dark of night, when we're in that canoe by ourselves, and it gives that us that, that not, we see that North Star, we know the direction that we need to head. We may not know exactly where we're going, but we know the direction is right. And so we can move forward. We can start paddling in that direction. So it really helps us to move forward. It gives us, you know, again, that sort of that courage to move forward um, and helps us kind of clarify, you know, what really matters to us, where we should be using our, 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 our strengths and our talents. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of purpose because there's been some interesting research that has, has come out recently on purpose. You know, it's been, the benefits have been known, you know, very well in religion for, you know, for centuries. Business and science have started to come around more recently. And, there, you know, again, there have been some interesting studies that have been done um, that have shown that people with a strong sense of purpose live longer than those that do not. I think the, the, the study found that on average seven years of longevity were found for people who indicated that they had that they were living strong purposeful lives that they had a strong sense of purpose purpose lowers lowers rates of depression and anxiety and increases levels of life satisfaction at work employees with purpose miss less work outperform their peers in productivity and tenure and are more likely to be in leadership positions so begin to see some of the benefits of having a strong sense of purpose. Moreover, people want purpose. This is not just something that's good to have, but people really want it. And in one study, employees said that they would give up nearly a quarter of their lifetime earnings for work that was meaningful to them. So that's profound. They're choosing meaning over money. They want more meaningful work and experiences. It's not just about the money, it's about the meaning of the work that they're doing. Nearly 90% of millennials reported higher work satisfaction when provided with opportunities to make a positive impact on social justice issues. So again, connecting meaning to the work that people are doing gave higher work satisfaction. Somewhat recently, a third of employees at the company base camp quit after the company banned political and societal discussions. Now I'm not, arguing whether that was right or wrong. But I think one of the things that you see here is that people wanna be able to connect and, and, and have, and again, have these sort of conversations of what matters to them at work. You know, they wanna be able to, to have work be a place where what they care about is, is in play, is able to be discussed and talked about. And McKinsey has even gotten on the, on the purpose train and in 2020, they released a study called Igniting Individual Purpose in Times of Crisis, all about how leaders and companies could use people's individual purpose, could use their employees' individual purpose in times of crisis, COVID, 
um, you know, to really um, uh, boost employee engagement and employee productivity. So, you know, when, 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 when the, the, the smart guy, the geniuses at McKinsey, you know, start rep producing reports about this stuff, you know, we, we, we know it's, it's uh, <laughs> we know we got to listen. Okay, so I want to I wanna define a little bit more what purpose is. Again, purpose is what's most deeply meaningful to you, who you are at your essence. And let's go a little bit deeper. It isn't a title or a role. Your purpose is not to be the leader of this company or the CEO of that company or the executive director of that organization. It's not a title, it's not a role. It goes deeper than that. It goes, it go, it goes below that. And actually one of the things you see is often people who are so identified with their roles when they leave their role, either they're, you know, they retire or they're burned out and they step out of it or they get fired or whatever it is, um, they often face this sort of lack of identity, this identity, this crisis in who am I? Because they often don't have a strong sense of their purpose. When we have a strong sense of our purpose, a title or a role is just one expression, one way we're expressing our deeper purpose. It's not the be all end all. And so this is one way that, that purpose can be really helpful, having a strong sense of purpose, is that it frees us from overly identifying with the title or the role that we're currently in. And this shows us that that's one way we're expressing our purpose, not the only way. Purpose is always true. So it's not like, you know, my purpose is only true at work or my purpose is only true when I'm hanging out with my friends. Purpose is universal because it's who you are at your essence. And that's always who you are at your essence, whether it's in a job or whether it's with your, your friends and family or your volunteer, you know, um, your volunteer life or, you know, your, your weekend warrior, you know, sporting, sporting life. You know, it's, it's who you are at your essence and what's most deeply meaningful to you. So it's always got to be true. Purpose is about impact. It's so it's, it is, it is about what you are bringing to the world, the expression. And so there is, there is a component to purpose that is about impact. It is about putting out there something into the world that we want to have an impact. We want to be impactful in the world. And so there is, there is a sense So it's not just a sort of personal thing that I kind of keep quiet, keep to myself, you know, only for me. It does, there is this, this aspect of it that has an impact and kind of connects with the outside world. Again, it provides guidance and direction. So if your purpose is not helping you, help and guide you in your life, is not helping you make tough decisions and choices about what you should be doing and not doing, then you may not have nailed it. You may not have gotten, you know, sort of an effective purpose, um, you know, articulated. And it stretches us beyond our current limits. So there is this aspect that, you know, purpose is, um, is not this sort of comfortable, you know, easy thing, you know, nobody's purpose is to sort of sit home and watch, you know, Netflix all night. Purpose is about aspiring to sort of put the best that we, we can out into the world and to achieve impact. It's stretching us, it's constantly sort of pushing us forward, you know, bring in, trying to, trying to pull us to our, our final destination. Um, and so there is, there is an element where it should be encouraging us to stretch beyond our current limit to stretch and grow. Okay, so there is no right or wrong purpose. It's what is uniquely meaningful to you. And so we can't sort of share and we can't sort of take somebody else's purpose. You can say, oh, I like that purpose. I'm going I'm to take that. Um, and there's no, and it's nice. There's no wrong, right or wrong purpose. It's, um, put Fred in there, sorry. Um, it's, it, it is really, um, it, it's totally unique, you know, kind of like a fingerprint. Um, it's unique to you. I mean, obviously people can have sort of similar or overlapping purposes, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody else's purpose is. It's, it's again, what is meaningful to you. Okay, so I want to look at a little bit, take just a, a little time um, without going kind of geeking out on it too much is, is what is meaningful to us and how do things become meaningful to us? Because I think this is an, an, just an important grounding to know that a lot of our purpose actually, it's not some woo, you know, woo woo sort of uh, new age thing that we get from like a Ouija board. It's actually quite neuroscientific. It comes, it has a basis in our, uh, in our biology and our physiology. And so, you know, we have to understand a little bit about how our brains work. And 
really um, novelty and reward are the sort of core drivers of meaning. It all starts with the excitement and reward mechanisms in the brain. So the more stimulating, stimulating an activity is, which is the novelty part, and the bigger the potential payoff, which is the reward part, the more likely we are to want to do that thing because it's giving us excitement, it's giving us that stimulation that we crave, that our brains crave, and it's giving uh, it's it's tapping the reward centers of our brain. So you know, thank you, dopamine and serotonin, for that. So our amygdala, which is the almond-shaped uh, piece of the brain in our in our midbrain in our limbic system. What our amygdala does is it assigns significance to new stimuli. So whenever we have new stimuli, the amygdala is constantly assessing. It's assessing, does this matter? Is this important? Should I be afraid of this? Should I like this? Is this important enough to, to you know, kind of wake me up, to go on alert, that I need to pay attention to this? So we have the, the amygdala doing that. And then we have the hippocampus, which is responsible for, me for, for memory, for long-term memory. It reviews all of these past experiences that we have to determine if what is happening now is significant to us or not. So it's like, okay, this thing is like, you know, waking me up. This is, you know, I, I gotta pay some attention to this. Oh, and as after reviewing it, this is something that actually has some meaning to me. This is something I really find meaningful to do. So every time I step onto a tennis court and a ball is coming at me, stimulation goes up. My hippocampus says, you know, this is, you know, your dad taught you to play tennis when you were you know, when you were six years old and it was our family sport and, you know, it, you know, I've had a lot of experience and fun times with tennis. This is a meaningful thing to me. So in a nutshell, something registered in your brain is new and interesting. The reward centers of your brain got activated and that compelled you to repeat the experience again and again until it became central to who you are. So that's how, how in a nutshell, things become meaningful to, to us. So I'm going to go through some of the, the um, main sources of purpose, the main uh, places that purpose comes from. And in the book, I do a number of case studies. I, I interview a number of people who are high performers, living very purpose-grounded lives, very grounded in values, very much um, uh, central uh, with a central vision. And so these are some of the people that, that I, I interview in the book and some of the themes that came out of that uh, as the sources of purpose. So survival. So I interviewed Ethan Zahn. He's the winner of Survivor Africa and a cancer survivor. Survival ha has been a big theme for him in his life. And he, he has re really sort of taken, you know, one survivor, he used the, the money to uh, establish a organization called Grassroots Soccer that does uh, AIDS education and health education in Africa um, and was then diagnosed with cancer and decided to make his, his cancer um, uh, battle very public and posted, you know, on social media and was very public about what he was going through and is a big advocate now in the cancer research uh, community. Um, and that has really, you know, become one of his kind of central drivers of, of purpose is, is re really surviving and helping other people's other people survive. A cause or principle can be a, 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 a strong driver of purpose. I interviewed Leidon Tetong, who is a Tibetan freedom activist, was at the time was the uh, president of Students uh, for Free Tibet uh, in New York City. Um, and she's got this deep connection to um, fighting for just social justice and freedom um, of, in this case, of, of, of her people, of the Tibetan people. Love and service to others. So I interviewed Dick Hoyt, who some of you may know. We actually just lost him this, this past year. Uh, Dick Hoyt was an endurance athlete who would participate in endurance uh, events with his son who was born a paraplegic in a wheelchair and he would he would participate with with him in these races these ironman races he would swim with a boat tied around his waist he would run pushing him in a wheelchair he would bike with him um, on on uh, you know a sort of homemade contraption where he could ride on the bike and he would do, he would do that so that his son could have normal, the normal experiences um, that, you know, um, you know, somebody that was not disabled could have. And he said, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, you know, I I'm just the body. My son is, is the heart. My son is the reason that I, I that I'm doing this. 
loss and heartbreak. So this is another one. Sometimes our deepest pain, our deepest loss, our deepest heartbreak becomes the source of our purpose. So I interviewed Nancy Baker, whose, whose daughter was tragically lost to a preventable hot tub accident, um, something faulty in the, in the drainage system. Um, and she got her hair uh, stuck on the bottom of the drain. And so every parent's worst nightmare. Um, and Nancy Baker, who was this sort of introverted painter, became this advocate um, for hot tub safety and, and became a crusader, was on Larry King Live, uh, went in front of Congress, lobbied Congress, and ultimately was able to get a bill passed um, that required uh, certain changes to be made um, to make sure that this, this accident that was killing hundreds of children every year would never happen again. And it, it gave her the courage to act. And she said, you know, when I was on Larry King Labo, I wasn't nervous at all. I thought I would be, but it was really the, you know, the, the knowledge that I could get my message out um, was really what, 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 you know, drove me forward and gave me courage. Identity, our sense of identity of who we are often can be a source of our purpose. So I interviewed Soraya Sadid, who is the head of, um, a, a nonprofit organization supporting uh, women and girls in Afghanistan. Now they've been around for, for 20, uh, 20 plus years. Um, and we know Afghanistan is, is, is back in the news again and there's a huge, huge need and, and kind of you know, humanitarian crisis happening there now. But Soraya Sadid was a, was a successful businesswoman in, in the United States, um, had um, some things happen in her life that caused her to question whether that was uh, was really what was important to her. Um, and she went back to thinking about her roots in Afghanistan um, and went back, raised a, a bunch of money uh, under a lot of uh, threat to her own, um, her own safety, her own personal safety, um, brought money in and established uh, a bunch of schools for girls um, and helped, helped uh, you know, the, the cause of of education for girls in Afghanistan um, because of that commitment, that, that sense of identity connection to, to, to identity. Okay, so I wanna just switch gears here now that you know um, you have the definition of purpose, you understand sort of the benefits of purpose, um, you, you understand some of the sources of purpose. I actually wanna give you an opportunity to come up with your own a draft purpose statement. And so this is in the book, a lot of the book that each chapter ends with a kind of your turn activity where I guide you through um, how, to, how to be able to articulate your own purpose statement, how to come up with your own set of core values and determine whether you are living those values um, in, in sufficiently uh, or if there are some gaps there. How to do some visioning so that you can actually um, um, really paint a clear picture of your future vision for yourself when you meet yourself, you know, 20 years from now in the future. So that and, and, and a bunch of other activities that, that, um, that accompany each chapter. And I want to share with you the purpose, the purpose activity. So if you have a pen and a piece of paper and you can grab that. That would be awesome. You don't have to share these. This is just this is just for you. So um, you know, don't don't worry about you know sort of being being on the spot to to share. Okay. So these are these are I'm going to give you a few prompts that will help you to extract kind of the key elements of your purpose. So the first one is I'd like you to think of a time when you felt most alive, most fulfilled, most impactful. What were the key aspects of what, what made it so meaningful? So think of that time, really try and get to that place, get yourself to that place. It could be a specific moment or it could be a period of time in your life. And it could be recent past or it could be a long time ago. Just when you felt most alive, most fulfilled, like most you were really making the impact. and just write down what made it so meaningful.
Okay, second prompt. So imagine that you're starting a nonprofit organization to make an impact on a cause that matters deeply to you. Just take a moment and jot down, what does the organization do? Okay, number three, if you were to ask the people who know you best, what would they say your superpowers are? So these are the people who know you the best. What would they say your superpowers are? This is, these are attributes that come so naturally that you do them just without thinking. Okay, and the last one. So imagine that you have one post on social media that has been guaranteed to go viral. So millions of people will see it and repost it. What does it say? And it doesn't have to be the exact wording. It could be just, you know, the idea. So don't, don't worry too much about like having to get the, the wording right. And if as some of my clients don't like social media, imagine it's a billboard. Imagine you have an opportunity to put um, put a, 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 a short, a short thing, you know, you know, thing up on, on a billboard that lots of people are going to see, you know, it's in the middle of Times Square in New York. Um, what would it say? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is I want, every, I want you to take a look at all the words and phrases you generated and circle the ones that feel most important to you. Feel the, circle the ones that have the most kind of energy and power in them for you. And after you've done that, I want you to use those words and phrases that you circled to come up with a statement that captures the essence of who you are and the impact you want to make as a result. Again, it should be universally true, meaning that it applies to all aspects, all aspects of your life. It's not just only true in you know, certain situations. And using this format, you can change this format later, but this is a good starter format. I am blank, and that blank is the essence of being, who blank, and that blank is the impact you have on the world. I am blank, the essence of being, who blank, the impact on the world. I'll give you some examples. So I am my best, that's the essence of being, is my best, who helps others be their best. That's the impact I have on the world. That, that, that one is mine, um, just to, to, to in all transparency. If I want to be a little bit more poetic about it, a little bit more you know, metaphorical about it, I say I am the vital spark who fires up potential. And a couple of other examples from, from clients. I am the learner who challenges myself and others to grow. I am a leader who transforms can'ts into can-dos. 
And then one which I, I love because it's it's very uh, indicative of, of the purpose statement. I simplify complexity. So just take a couple minutes and, and using this format, using kind of the ideas from these examples to see if you can just get a draft statement. Again, it's a first draft. Okay, so you can keep working on that after we're done, um, but I wanna give you just a couple of tips for using purpose, how you go about using, okay, you have this draft purpose statement now, what do you do with it? So first thing is connect with your purpose daily. Look at it, recite it, really be in contact with it because that's, you know, it, 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 this is all about having access to it, understanding your purpose, being able to, call it up quickly as a, a sports psychologist, uh, Michael Gervais, uh, who works with the Seattle Seahawks says, you know, you should be able to write your seek, you, you should be able to recite your purpose in a dark alley. You know, if somebody says, what's your purpose? You should be able to, so it should be short. It should be something that you have, you know, kind of top of mind. So connect with your purpose daily. Use it when you need to increase your motivation and engagement. You know, it's like, oh, here's this thing. Like, I really need a little bit more, you know, gas in the tank for this. You know, it could be, you know, the last mile you're running in a marathon. It could be, you know, you got this presentation that you have to get done. Um, you're tired and it's late and, you know, you need, you just need that sort of final push. You know, going back to your purpose, going back to, you know, again, what is most deeply meaningful to you, the, the essence of who you are, and the impact that you want to have. Use it to help make choices about what you say yes and no to. So this is, you know, purpose is a very good, is this on purpose or not on purpose? You know, is this new job that I'm taking or that, I, that I'm, I have the opportunity to take or interview for, is this aligned with my purpose or not aligned with my purpose? It helps you, it helps you make these kinds of choices. Use it as a guide when navigating difficult decisions in times of uncertainty. So again, when, when, when there's a lot of chaos and uncertainty, like there has been the last couple of years, and like it seems like there will continue to be, our purpose is really there to help us provide directionality, right? Okay, you know, so next time you have a difficult decision um, or you're, you, you need to make a decision where you don't have all of the, um, you know, all the data, all the facts, use your purpose and see if that helps you. And use it when you need the courage to move forward, you feel scared or stuck and sort of invoke your purpose and see, and see how that helps. Okay, so again, this is all from my new book, The Peak Performance Formula, Achieving Breakthrough Results in Life and Work. Uh, you know, the book came out two weeks ago and it was uh, lucky enough to be a number one new release in business, health and stress. Uh, Eric Schmidt um, blurbed the book. He said, we all need tools and tactics to achieve at the highest levels, both at work and in life. This book gives you the framework. Thank you, Eric. Uh, the book's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop, and IndieBound. If you want to support your uh, local independent uh, bookstores, uh, you can buy it on, on IndieBound. So you know, if you found today you know, useful, interesting, want to know a little bit more what's in there, want to get a little bit deeper into the peak performance formula, uh, you know, I'd appreciate it. Love it if you, if you would pick up a copy of the book. Thank you. If you want to reach me, uh, follow me on Instagram at Bob underscore Lesser, my website, boblesser.com. You can also contact me through, through my website. So thank you guys very much. I'll stop here and I think we have some time for some questions. Thank you, Bob. That was a great presentation. Um, yes, I've been reading your book and I love your book. So um, just FYI, people um, who are here, please uh, note the library does have copies of this book. Um, there is a waiting list right now, but um, you can add yourself to the waiting list. But um, like Bob said, you can also purchase this book at Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other places. Um, there are a few questions, so I'm going to read some of them. Oh, uh, before I ask you the question, someone wanted you to uh, please repeat the Muhammad Ali quote. Yes. Yeah. My only fault is that I don't realize how great I really am. Uh, thank you. 
Okay, so I just see a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, um, if one third of employees will quit unless they can have political and societal discussions at work and a different one third of employees don't like political and dis societal discussions at work, what do you recommend the manager to do? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think every company needs to sort of, you know, grapple with this. I, I, I really just use that data to show that I think people want to be able to bring their full selves to their work. They want to be able to do work that's meaningful, that's connected to the issues that matter to them. They want to be able to talk about those things. So, you know, I don't think there's an easy answer. The, the, the reason that these companies have banned political and societal speech is because they want people to focus on the work. They don't want it to become a distraction. So, I mean, you know, one recommendation would be that just that they create forums for, uh, you know, for employees to be able to have these discussions that don't interfere with the workday. So they can come up with some, some, you know, policies and protocols that make sure that people are, you know, uh, focused on the work, doing the work, committed to, you know, the work and delivering the outcomes that they have to deliver, uh, but also have an opportunity to, you know, be who they are, talk about what they care about. Um, but the point was that, that, People and special, especially millennials, really care about um, you know meaning and work, and they're going to leave places. They're not going to work in places that you know say, hey, you can't talk about things that matter to you here. So that was really the you know the, the major point of that, that piece of data. Thank you. Uh, another question is, what is the connection between being designed for survival and working against our own success? Yeah, so the connection, you know, there is that it, it really goes back to our nervous systems. Our, our nervous systems were really designed, you know, with a stress response, and they and they haven't. It, our nervous systems haven't evolved over the last thousand thousand years. We are still looking for the saber tooth tiger and trying to keep ourselves safe from the saber tooth tiger, right? So this is our stress stress response system. Many of you are familiar with it: fight, flight, freeze, and appease. It's what happens, our amygdala gets activated and we go into stress response. And you know they've done brain scans that show that social threat, so being excluded, being, um, being, uh, having, having negative feedback being given to us, being, being you know, judged unfairly, triggers the same, activates the same part of our brains as when we are under physical threat. So, so we, are, we are just, you know, in many ways, we are just trying to survive. And that stress response and sort of um, not being in charge of our emotions, but really having our emotions be in charge of us is a huge impediment to performance. It's a huge, and we need to be able to keep ourselves calm, relaxed. We need, to be, we need to be in command of our nervous systems in order to perform at our best. So, so, so that, that's one of the ways. Another one of the ways is, again, this negativity bias. You know, this is what neuro, neuroscientists have dubbed the negativity bias. We are much more likely to focus on and amplify negative things in our life. So the example there is we're walking in the forest and we're on the lookout for the twig that may be a snake. And we're gonna pay much more attention to the threats out there than we are to the flowers, the beautiful flower that we can stop and smell and admire and enjoy. And so in the, in the same ways, we amplify negative, we amplify the things that are not going right for us, we amplify our flaws, we amplify, you know, the ways in which we are not living up to our own expectations. And we don't, we're not able to be as fulfilled as a result, as happy with the accomplishments that we have, with the things that we are, um, you know, have really achieved. And so that gets in the way of a lot of our own fulfillment, as well as our own day to day performance. A lot of people won't even do things because they're scared that they're going to fail at them. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is hardwired into us, um, as opposed to, you know, get, we, we have to find some ways to manage that. So we can do really hard things that we may fail at that may feel a little bit a little bit scary or dangerous to us, because these are the challenges that ultimately lead to our kind of breakthrough achievements. You're on mute, Kirsty. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Bob. Um, does anyone have any questions? We ran through all the questions in the in the chat. All right. Well, if no one has any questions, I'll thank you, Bob, for um, for doing this author talk with us. 
I'm so I'm so glad that you um, you shared your book with us. And again, I'm almost done with it. I love all the, the food for thought and all the exercises. Um, I'm, I think about this, this stuff all the time. Um, you know, since I started reading it this weekend. So I really appreciate it. And it's a great book. I highly recommend it to everyone who's here. Um, so thank you. Does um, no last question? All right. Oh yeah, someone's clapping for you in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to say it's a it's a book that I think you can kind of come back to over time. There may be parts of the book that are more or less relevant to you right now. Um, but I do think it is kind of a guide for leadership, for leading in, in, in tough conditions, for consistently improving yourself and moving forward in your life and your career. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do, you know, I, I do hope that it's, you know, something that sort of is a reference, a little bit of a reference resource for people to say, oh, yeah, that, that part on, you know, I'm not experiencing imposter syndrome right now, but, you know, next year I'm, I take this new job where I'm, I'm junior and I have less experience than everyone and I'm, and I'm experiencing it. What do I do? Oh yeah. There's that, there's that, you know, that piece on imposter syndrome and how to, how to deal with it and how to, how to transform it. Let me read that piece and do that, do some of that work. Absolutely. Yes. I think it's something that you can just keep reading, um, refer to when you need to. Okay. Congratulations on the book and the excellent reviews that you've been getting and Again, thank you for sharing your time with us. Uh, someone wrote in the chat, thank you, Bob, very inspiring. Looking forward to reading this book. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, Peter, appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks again for joining and taking, taking the time. And, uh, you know, I, I hope you're reading and, you know, and find, find a ton of use from it. So thank you all. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I right, have a great afternoon. Bye.